I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Amaranth Mayor Bob Curry not backing down on comments he made in council. And if it's a true statement, wh why would I apologize for what I said? The longtime mayor responding to a resident's letter asking why the township isn't flying a pride flag this month. This is what Curry said near the end of the meeting. If everybody was either lesbian or homosexual, this would be the last generation on earth because two homosexuals cannot produce offspring. Two lesbians cannot produce offspring. So why would I want to support something when there's, this would be the last generation on earth? I'm not going to go there. Curry, a devout Christian, saying the pride flag has never been raised in his 18 years as mayor. If I hurt somebody, well, that's, that's, that's their problem, not mine. But anyways, I did not say what, I don't say what I do say, okay, to offend people. The letter to council came from Stacy Whittington. Like, just horrified that in 2020, in this township, with a large LGBTQ community that our mayor is saying these things and having them inform his choices as our mayor. Disgraceful. This, uh... Jim Waddington is a member of the gay community, an organizer of Orangeville Pride. He says he and 2,000 others who have signed an online petition are calling for Curry to step down as mayor. Your fossil mentality uh, in regards to this type of uh, new world needs to be uh, removed. At the time, Deputy Mayor Chris Garretts didn't speak out against Curry's comments. I was more caught off guard. I'm, I'm upset that I didn't say anything, and um, but that's the reason why. That's what I But Curry out. says he's been overwhelmed with support and not everyone in town is calling for his resignation. Everybody has a right to say what they feel and that was his personal belief. Well, I'm not no one to knock him down or anybody else that feels that way or doesn't feel that way. Curry's daughter Susan says her 80-year-old father is not homophobic. He is a fantastic business person. He's a loving father. He's an incredible grandfather, and he would never, ever do anything to offend someone or hurt someone. He's not a politician. He speaks the truth. He speaks his mind. Curry says he has no plans to step down. You're not going anywhere. Not at the moment. I'm not anyways. No. Hope to go to heaven someday. Traditional family is under attack like no other time in history. God instituted marriage between one man and one woman and is very holy to him. Why is marriage between a man and a woman so sacred to God? Genesis 2, 23 and 24. And Adam said, This is now a bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Ephesians 5, 31 through 33. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. By mystery, Paul means the hidden plan of God that has come to fulfillment in Christ Jesus as we read in Ephesians 3, 9, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Thus, the Apostle Paul's quotation about marriage from Genesis 2 and Ephesians 5, 31 ties into the relationship between Christ and his church. Paul's meaning is profound. He interprets the original creation of the husband and wife union as itself modeled on Christ's forthcoming union with the church as his body, as we read in Ephesians 5.23. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, marriage from the beginning of creation in Genesis 1 was created by God to be a reflection of and patterned after Christ's relation to the church. Thus, Paul's commands regarding the roles of husbands and wives do not merely reflect the culture of his day, but also the present. God's ideal for all marriages at all times, as exemplified by the relationship between the Bride of Christ, the Church, 
and Christ himself, the Son of God. The biblical concept of marriage is a oneness between two individuals that pictures the oneness of Christ with his church. Satan is busy in these last days, destroying marriage in every way possible. He got a foothold when gay marriage was legalized and now anything goes. Satan hates marriage and in particular he hates Christian marriages because believers display the gospel and glorify God in their marriage. Satan thus aims to destroy Christian marriages because such opposition hinders the witness of Christ to the world. 1 Peter 5.8 Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Well, turning overseas, a series of massive and mysterious explosions has rocked Iran's nuclear and missile facilities in just the last few days. As Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, many in the Middle East want to know who is behind these explosions and what this means for Iran's nuclear program. The biggest explosion took place Thursday, July 2nd at Natanz, one of Iran's main nuclear centers. It damaged a new centrifuge assembly center designed to enrich uranium. An Iranian official explained Iran's version of what happened. Today, at around 2 a.m., there was an incident as a result of which there were physical damages. Thank God we haven't had fatalities. The New York Times reported that a Middle East intelligence official said Israel was responsible and also cited a member of Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps who said an explosive was used. This satellite image at Natanz showed extensive damage, but the Natanz explosion wasn't the only recent incident. An explosion hit Iran's strategic missile complex at Kojir on June 25th, and another blast at a medical center in Tehran last Tuesday killed at least 19. With so many explosions in the space of just several days, many in the region are asking who's behind these blasts. A Kuwaiti newspaper, Al Jarida, claimed Israel used F-35s to attack Iran's missile production complex. Then a group calling themselves the Cheaters of the Homeland claimed responsibility for the explosion at Natanz. Some security experts also believe an Israeli cyber attack led to the Kojir blast. Here in Israel, when asked about the explosions, Foreign Minister Gabi Ashkenazi said, our actions in Iran are better left unsaid. While alternate Prime Minister Benigan said, not every event in Iran is necessarily related to us. How Iran responds to these incidents remains to be seen. Regardless of whether or not Israel is behind these incidents, Middle East expert Seth Fransman says Israel's goal is clear. Obviously, Israel does not want there would be any conditions under Iran would, I think, would acquire a nuclear device or a system to deliver it. Because if you build the nuclear bomb, you also need a rocket to deliver it somewhere. So both of those would be, I assume, technology that Iran must not possess. And Israel and, and the United States, I think, have been very clear on, on not having that happen. On Monday, Israel launched a new spy satellite. And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu extended the term of Israel's spy chief until next year. Analysts see both as signs of the ongoing simmering war between the Islamic Republic of Iran and the Jewish state of Israel. As we continue to watch Bible prophecy unfold, it seems as though the war of Gog and Magog is looming on the horizon. Ezekiel 38, 1 through 9. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, 
the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords, Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Garma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes, and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that many people believe will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18 through 23, and 39 to 7 and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8, 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, You touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Matthew 24, 6 and 7 And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Nation is the Greek word ethnos, which means a race, as of the same habit, i.e. a tribe, especially a foreign, non-Jewish one, Gentiles, usually by implication, pagan. What I believe Jesus is saying here is that there have always been wars and rumors of wars. But when you see the same ethnic group fighting the same ethnic group, now pay attention. His return is near. Uh, Yemen is on the brink of collapse and it is so hard to even get information, let alone pictures from there. We work with UNICEF and Save the Children because you can't go to uh, the country to get uh, this reporting uh, out of the country. And it is 
something that we are responsible for. Just last year, President Trump vetoed a bipartisan bill that would have stopped America's support for the Gulf countries that are waging war uh, in Yemen. And the death toll is terrifying. Already 100,000 Yemenis have died. UNICEF predicting that 6,600 children could die in the next six months. Even before coronavirus, few seem to care about Yemen. Half a decade of civil war, a failed intervention from America's allies, Saudi Arabia, all allowed to drag on. Now, shattered from the horror of bombs and bullets, a humanitarian nightmare. Yemenis are in a fight for survival against a new kind of death, a silent and invisible killer. We talk about coronavirus hitting particularly people with pre-existing conditions. In Yemen, the entire country has a pre-existing condition. You're talking about a situation where people are already poor. 80% of the population is already poor, below the poverty line. Ten-month-old Amir is one of them. While the world was in lockdown, he made a 150-mile journey across the desert by bus with his mother to a hospital in Sana'a. His diarrhea was getting worse and he was losing weight, his mom, Amamiya, says. Amir, suffering from malnutrition, Dr. Ibn Hamam tells us, is lucky he made it to a hospital. Half already shut down by the coronavirus crisis. Many have been closed and used for quarantine, he says. They used to take care of children, perform surgeries and internal medicine. It's a real problem. But it's not just the children. Like so many around the world, this coronavirus patient is in an isolation unit. But this is rare for Yemen, not because there are few infections here, but because there are so few places for treatment and testing. How many infections there are is virtually impossible to know. Nobody is counting. But the rows and rows of graves they're digging might be a terrible clue. And it's just the beginning. Johns Hopkins figures show that 27% of Yemenis who contract coronavirus are dying, five times the global average. As many as 16 million Yemenis could get um, coronavirus. 16 million. 16 million. So what we're talking about here is real survival by the day. They don't have water and they don't have soap. We're talking about almost 10 million people without access to safe drinking water. You can't talk about COVID and not talk about washing your hands with soap. And yet in March, the Trump administration said it was cutting up to $73 million in aid to areas of Yemen controlled by the Iranian-backed Houthis. The U.S. Agency for International Development calling it a, quote, difficult decision. But in May, after an outcry from the aid community, Secretary Pompeo announced $225 million in emergency food aid. While for five years, the U.S. has provided military, intelligence and logistical support to Gulf allies Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates in their war against the Iranian-backed Houthis. Support that has had deadly consequences. In 2018, a Saudi warplane dropped a bomb on a school bus in northern Yemen. It killed 44 children. It's a war that has turned Yemen into the greatest humanitarian crisis in the world. And now coronavirus could mean catastrophe. In Yemen, the health system wasn't coping even before coronavirus arrived. Exactly. And you have, you have now a system where health workers aren't paid. You don't have the infrastructure. You don't have the equipment and supplies. And so what we're talking about here is sheer life and death. We're talking about grappling to ensure that we can grasp these, these, these children before it's too late for them. The true toll of coronavirus may not be seen in medical statistics because they don't exist in Yemen, but in those lines of newly dug graves littering the landscape, a country already scarred by bombs, now traumatized by mass burials. We are going to begin tonight with a dangerous and growing surge of new coronavirus cases across 40 states, pushing hospitals to test limits taxing testing capacity and forcing governors to close businesses that had just reopened. And tonight, the country's top infectious disease doctor says most of those new cases are coming from young people who are getting and then spreading the virus. 
Dr. Anthony Fauci says the average age for new patients is now about 15 years younger than when the pandemic began, including in Florida, where 21-year-olds are now becoming infected at rates on average higher than any other group. Scenes like this of young people partying over the July 4th holiday have experts worried that the number of new cases will spiral out of control in the coming days. The mayor of Miami-Dade County now says he's issuing an emergency order shutting down indoor dining in restaurants as well as gyms and event spaces by Wednesday. And in Arizona, where infections jumped up 300 percent in June, Phoenix's mayor says her city is facing a crisis because of the demand for testing. One in four people tested for coronavirus there are positive. Tonight, we're also learning that Atlanta's mayor, Keisha Lance Bottoms, has the virus too. So as we come on the air tonight, the virus has killed more than 130,000 people nationwide. And there are more than 2.9 million confirmed cases here in the U.S. With the governor of Florida refusing to roll back any reopening, local mayors like the one here in Miami-Dade County say we will do it ourselves. So today, the mayor announced that starting Wednesday, there will be no outdoor or indoor dining allowed. You can still do takeout and delivery. I just spoke with a business owner who said, listen, I furloughed my employees. I took out a loan. I can't afford to close down again. But then you have others who are just as vocal in saying the mayor is doing the right thing. You guys are amazing out there. This is everything Americans were urged not to do. From Diamond Lake in Michigan to an overly crowded pool party in Wisconsin to the beaches of San Diego, the latest holiday celebration could lead to the next new COVID spike. In Arizona, where confirmed cases now top 100,000, lines just to get tested stretch for blocks. Tonight, there's late word out of Georgia that the mayor of Atlanta, Keisha Lance Bottoms, has tested positive for coronavirus, though she has no symptoms. This is startling for me because we've been so very careful. In a manageable crisis, about 5% of people should test positive. Arizona's rate is over 25%. Florida is at 18%. New York is down to one. An outbreak anywhere is an outbreak everywhere. Florida took over three months to reach 100,000 cases. It took just two weeks to reach 200,000. At Miami's Jackson Health System, the number of COVID patients in the ICU has tripled in the last month. Dr. Andrew Pastevsky is the ICU director at Jackson South. But I just saw on my list this morning, a 26 year old, 24 year old, and this disease has turned on people very quickly. According to Dr. Anthony Fauci, the average age of coronavirus patients has now dropped by 15 years. In the state of Florida, 21 year olds now make up the majority of cases here. Turns out the coronavirus can stay in the air longer than previously thought, especially indoors. These experts say airborne transmission is the only plausible explanation for super spreader events. Here's CBS News chief medical correspondent, Dr. John LaPook. Tonight, researchers around the world say the evidence shows the new coronavirus is likely airborne. When we cough, sneeze, talk, or sing, larger airborne droplets containing virus can travel, usually up to about six feet. But smaller particles called aerosols can go farther and linger longer. In some circumstances, those aerosols can travel more than 30 feet, more than the six feet recommended for social distancing. How certain are you that aerosols are playing a significant role in the transmission of COVID-19 past, say, six to eight feet? I think that's quite certain that that's happening. The implication is that you need to have everybody wearing masks and that you need to have good ventilation. Each layer of protection helps, like this cloth mask that partially blocks an aerosol from a simulated cough. Another layer of protection? Improve ventilation systems for schools, malls, nursing homes and businesses. With all the criticism that's been leveled at uh, police officers these days, what with protests and much more, we thought it would be illustrative to remind all of us to, of the fact that uh, police work is extremely dangerous and that from time to time, police officers, simply because they're doing their jobs, lose their lives. Case in point, Ohio over the 4th of July weekend. Our correspondent is Trinity Chavez. It was a weekend plagued with violence following a surge in shootings across the country. Here in New York City, 11 people were killed in just two days, 10 homicides occurring on Sunday alone. 
Today, many recovering from the nation's 4th of July weekend that was marred by gun violence. A spate of shootings throughout the U.S. left more than 150 people wounded and nearly two dozen dead. Chicago reporting 67 gunshot victims, a seven-year-old among the killed. And in New York City, officials reporting 41 people injured and at least nine people killed. And in Ohio, at least 20 people were shot and three people killed. Among the victims, 26-year-old Toledo police officer Anthony Dia, who died after being shot in the chest while responding to a 911 call of an intoxicated person in a Home Depot parking lot. I would hope that they also pause to reflect on the sacrifices that safety forces and especially police forces throughout our country also make every day, every night, with very little fanfare, often vilified, always underappreciated. According to 2019 data released by the FBI, 106 law enforcement officers were killed in the line of duty in 2018. That's a 13% increase from 2017. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy tells us in the last days society would be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. One day Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.